Welcome everyone and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as per usual on the Focus on Family, we've got uh, myself, Anna, here to tell you all about the differences of Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio. And we have Mahesh behind the scenes handling all things technical and questions. So please do uh, pop your questions in the Q&A as we go through. We're going to try a slightly different format to, to the last Focus On session we did. What we're going to do is we'll put the, the presentation, if you want to call it that, within 45 uh, minutes as allotted, and then we'll spill over with any extra questions. So that means that if anyone wants to rush off and have their dinner, then they certainly can. Uh, I've actually just wolfed down mine already, so that means I'm ready to hang out with you all, uh, especially if you've got some more questions at the end. I won't be in a rush and my tummy won't be rumbling. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see some of you using the chat already as well. So thank you. Please do let us know if you're tasting along this evening uh, and let us know where you are. We love to see uh, which corners of the earth you're dialing in from. So uh, what, a what a topic. Pinot Gris versus Pinot Grigio. Um, I don't really know. I don't know exactly why I was so obsessed or desperate to, to do this topic. I think it's because it's often very misunderstood. I think a lot of people either believe that they're not the same grape variety, uh, which they are, and I'll go on to that in a moment. But the other thing is that I think um, there's also misconceptions about Pinot Grigio, that it's always boring, not true, and about Pinot Gris, um, that some people often don't even know what Pinot Gris is, but if they do, they think it's always sweet and again, not true. So really, this is a bit of myth busting today. We love to myth bust um, and it will be a bit of a deep dive, but equally at the same time, hopefully we'll do it in a light and friendly manner with a glass or two or three to hand. So uh, without further ado, I will begin. Um, so before we go on to the presentation, I'll give you a small background into, into the genetics of the grape variety. So it's a mutation of Pinot Noir, and uh, it's part of the, the Pinot family, which is often a misused term. People around the world call think, different Pinots Pinot when they're not necessarily. Uh, but Pinot Noir, the, the black Pinot, the dark skinned one, uh, also known as Pinot Nero in Italy, Pinot Blanc, which is the white one, Pinot Bianco, and then you've got something in the middle, and that's Pinot Gris, which is uh, Pinot Grigio, or quite frankly, Pinot Grey. Uh, and that's because it's got this greyish blue tinge to the berries, um, sometimes a, a brownie pinky hue as well. Not as pink as Gewurztraminer, if you've ever seen a picture of that, um, but it's definitely got a tinge to it. And you will sometimes find that Pinot Gris in particular uh, has a has a, this slight pinkish hue to it, or something not quite sort of light and, and lemony wine. Um, another place that I find really interesting, we will cover where in the world it's produced, but it's worth mentioning because it's another uh, another Pinot, should we say. Um, Pinot Gris was actually commonly grown amongst the Pinot Noir vines of Burgundy. And to this day, you can still find it field blended. Very bad grammar, I apologise. Um, as a field blend to add... Um, uh, sort of an element of softness uh, and in Burgundy it's actually called Pinot Bero, Pinot Bero, sorry yes um, and yes you don't have to declare it so uh, uh, red Burgundy could be 85% Pinot Noir and a little bit of Pinot Bero. Uh, naturally as you can imagine it's not as commonly used it's quite a historical grape but you can still use it. It's permitted um, and it's used to sort of soften out Pinot Noir. I've had a comment from Mahesh saying, don't forget Brau Burgunda. Oh, sorry, it's from David Tucker. Not forgetting Grau Burgunda and Weiss Burgunda in um, Germany. Yes, David, don't worry. I'm coming on to Germany later. But if you wanted the German translation as well, uh, it's Spät Burgunda, which actually means late harvest for Pinot Noir. Uh, not quite the same as, as the black Pinot, but Spät Burgunda and then Weiss Burgunder being Pinot Blanc and then in the middle that Grau Burgunder. Um, we do actually have a Grau Burgunder for sale at the moment, I believe. Uh, I'll have to double check that, but I think we do and they're absolutely delicious. But I'll tell you a bit more about Germany shortly. 
let's talk about uh, Pinot Grigio first. Now, this kind of is a bit back to front because Pinot Grigio is not the original place um, of this grape variety or, or the, the sort of heartland. It has moved to Northern Italy where it became Pinot Grigio. But for the case of tasting and actually to be honest, for the, the reality of what is produced most, Pinot Grigio is our global dominated worldwide phenomenon. So let's start with Pinot Grigio um, and then we're going to work sort of backwards uh, and across Europe and across the world. So bear with me. But Pinot Grigio is probably um, not to everybody in the wine society's taste. And that's slightly unfair, but also slightly understandable because of the styles of wine that are commonly available using Pinot Grigio as a title, um, but it is the single most popular white wine on the planet. And it only took over from Chardonnay in the 21st century, but it is now the most popular white wine in the world. Um, it is usually unoaked. It's got this sort of semi-aromatic style to it. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the, the Italian name for the French grape variety, even though arguably it didn't even come from France. Uh, it was came to Italy in the 19th century and it came down through Piemont. I'm just going to pop up a map whilst I. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so, yes, for anybody who came to my north uh, west Italian, sorry, northeast Italian session, we touched on uh, Pinot Grigio and I will in a moment, but it actually came in from the north. Sorry. Yeah, it actually came in from the northwest through the Piemonte region. Here's an amazing statistic. 59 million litres of Pinot Grigio were sold in the UK off trade last year. And off trade means uh, not on a premises. So not in a bar or restaurant, just people buying Pinot Grigio to take home with them. 59 million litres. And the value of that was over £430 billion. That is how much Pinot Grigio the UK are drinking. Um, not all Pinot Grigio is made in the sort of light... I'm going to be really mean, watery dilute style. And that is actually where a lot of the popular mass market um, Pinot Grigios are positioning themselves. And that really, really very light style that is almost sort of just gluggable, yeah, um, inoffensive, should we say. Um, that comes from a particular place that I'll mention in a moment, but not all Pinot Grigio is made like that. So I'll just mention a couple of other places. In fact, it's not a hugely popular um, area, but in Friuli, which is far, far smaller production, they actually um, ferment it on the skins for longer and they make this orange hued wine called Romato, which means copper tinged, which is quite amazing. Um, the uh, Trentino Alto Adige, which is uh, where 9% of the UK's Pinot Grigio comes from, they produce here these more aromatic, richer styles, far in keeping with the traditional French Pinot Gris. But let's talk about the others. 44% comes from Veneto. Now, for anyone who came to my session on, uh, on Northeast Italy, we focused a lot on Veneto, and Veneto is where the bulk comes from. Uh, that's not to say that all Veneto Pinot Grigios are bad, but there is a, this big plane. Um, if you want to know more on that, do visit my Northeast Italy session. Um, 19% from Abruzzo, 15% from Sicily, uh, much warmer climate down there, and 8% from Lombardy, um, much cooler climate. Going back to Veneto really quickly, and let's jump into the map. Uh, the, the Veneto region does produce some really interesting Pinot Grigio, but what I will mention is there was a, a brand new DOC that was formed in 2017 called the Dele Venizzi, and it actually covers Frulli, um, Trentino Alto Adige and Veneto, and can be a blend of all of them as well, so they're really hedging their bets, and um, it has to be 85% Pinot Grigio, that's fine, that's an EU standard. I mentioned earlier, you can blend in 15% of something else in the EU. So if you see um, Pinot Grigio or Della Venizia DOC, 85% is probably Pinot Gris, but they can also blend in any other white grapes grown in the region. And they often do. And 
Uh, the only other rules are that there is a taste test by an independent panel and that the maximum yield is 126 hectolitres per hectare. Um, I'll explain a bit of a comparison about what that means when we get to our Grand Cru from Alsace. Um, but what you really need to know is that this, this newly formed DOC can have very high yields and high yields tend to produce a sort of inoffensive but quite neutral version of Pinot Grigio. So let's do the opposite. Let's take a Pinot Grigio from Italy that is not plain, not neutral, really light and refreshing in a really classic style and try our wine number one. Um, this is still Della Venizzi, so it's part of that DOC, but this particular wine um, is actually taken from, oh, I will jump back actually, sorry. Della Venizzi, um, as I mentioned, can be over a huge large area crossing these three regions here. However, um, it, a lot of that can be on the flat plains. Now, this particular wine does not go up to that 126 hectolitres. And really importantly, and particularly, particularly for Pinot Grigio, it's actually grown on the hillsides around Verona. They pick it um, mid-harvest. So what I mean by that is they don't pick it really early when the acidity is high, but the flavors haven't developed and they don't wait like we'll see with our next two wines and they don't hold on um, until there's this extra development and unctuousness. They pick it right in the middle. Enough flavor, but not that overt ripeness. And what I find really interesting as well is the winemaker for this wine is actually a, a Kiwi guy um, called Matt Thompson. And I really do think he brings a bit of a Kiwi element to this, um, thinking about things. And, and I will say a statement. The whole point of this is about the difference between Pinot Grigio and Pinot Gris. Uh, there's two reasons. One is where is it grown? And the second is how is it made? And really, those are the two different things, because other than that, genetically, they are the same. So we've talked about where it's grown now. Um, to give a bit more colour to that, uh, it's, in a, it's in a relatively um, sunny region, but we've just said that it's on a hillside, so there's a bit of elevation cooling it down, but it's still sunny. Um, and then how is it made? Um, well, we've talked about, well, how is it grown? We've talked about slightly lower yields than the rest of the region, but not as low as our final one. And then we're going to talk about winemaking. So this is cool fermentation. So they're really retaining the freshness and they're not over extracting and they're keeping the alcohol relatively reasonable as well. Yeah, 13 degrees. That's um, pretty, pretty spot on for a, a Pinot Grigio. Uh, they use stainless steel vats. They don't want to have any sort of oxidation or aging here. They release it young. Um, and there's about two to three grams of residual sugar here. So it's not got zero sugar it's only got two or three grams which to the most well I think almost any palate would not really detect two to three grams but there is this lovely acidity with it as well so I'm going to have a quick taste mm. it's so beautifully refreshing but it's not watery um there's an amazing acid it's it's perhaps more simple than the wines we're going to go on to, but intentionally so. It's sort of lemon, lime. I'm getting loads of grapefruit. Um, my Benito uh, uh, vintages aren't great, but I'm suspecting 2020 was a warmer year because Pinot Grigio with a bit of grapefruit is often coming from a slightly warmer year. Um, somebody, I think, just mentioned the perfume, sorry, and I completely agree. Um, Pinot Gris has perfume and flavours of Pinot Gris, but no depth. Peter, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, Pinot Gris is very aromatic, but it also has this huge richness that we'll go on to. Um, it's produced in such a different way. Pinot Grigio, intentionally, they don't have that style. They don't look for that um, broad, full palette in the Veneto area. They do in Fruli, I've just mentioned. Um, but they don't look for that sort of um, wide, broad, dense palette. They look for much, something much lighter. That mid-harvest picking time is going to keep the acidity higher, um, that freshness. So all of the things that you're, you know, you're experiencing are intentional choices. Um, it's not, it's not by accident. It's certainly by design. But for me, packs 
<laughs> pardon me, it packs a real punch, this. There is some real flavour. Um, the other, I do get green apples on the nose and I do get the minerality that Sarah mentions in this um, in this tasting note. But I also get um, uh, lemon peel. It's sort of a, uh, yeah, it's not quite as, I do get the squeeze of the lemon, but I get a bit of a lemon peel thing as well. So there's a decent amount of complexity in here for a Pinot Grigio. I, I think I showed this picture did I show this picture last week? Um, beautiful, beautiful vineyards around here. And it's not the best photo in the world, I apologise. But these sort of rolling hills and just outside Verona, so an amazing place to visit. Um, but also designed to be drunk in, in the sunshine and in the summer and in these sunny climates. And um, yeah, it's it's got this sort of beautiful just citrusy thing um and I wasn't going to do food and wine pairings today but this to me having just had it fresh out the fridge just screams seafood um my family a huge amount of seafood we're always talking about things to go with oysters um you know this kind of stacks up with it with a, a low level muscadet you've got all those similar things you've got salinity you've got um uh, by that sort of you know sea salt slight thing going on but you've also got lemon in spades so um a squeeze of that over a piece of fresh fish or seafood it's an absolute no-brainer for me um oh Mahesh has just told me something that I'm not allowed to reveal but there might be some good news coming on uh, on this wine in the future. So I can't reveal it, Mahesh. Don't distract me. <laughs> but uh, keep an eye on that wine. Put it like that. It's um, yeah, it certainly packs above its price point and above its weight uh, in terms of quality. So keep your keep your eyes peeled. But naughty Mahesh told me a very interesting piece of information. So uh, let's go on to, uh, but well, sorry, before we go on to the Alsace, which is sort of the heartland of where the Pinot Gris style is grown. Um, and naturally, that's where the name comes from. But we're going to visit New Zealand first. But before we visit New Zealand, let's do a quick whistle stop tour about where else it's grown. So um, there are small pockets in the Loire, really interestingly called Malvoisie. Um, it's also called Malvoisie in Switzerland, uh, in the Valais region, but actually there they produce these very rich styles, um, more akin to the, to the Alsatian styles. It makes sense that it's, that it's from, uh, you know, that it's grown around places like this because it's believed potentially, not certainly, but there's a potential that it actually derives from Hungary. Um, and for that reason, in Alsace, they used to call it Tokai Pinot Gris. And I was driving through Alsace yesterday and I'm so annoyed I didn't get a photo. There's a huge barrel. Um, who was it outside? Um, there was a huge barrel and I've never seen it before, but it said Tokai Pinot Gris in huge white letters on the barrel. Um, and it was obviously a, an old, uh, beautiful building. But it very much is still sort of regionally referred to as that. Um, but quite rightly, Hungarians got a bit peeved because it's not Tokai. Um, so you're no longer technically allowed to call it that, but it was for a long time. Um, so naturally, on its, its journey to eastern France, it has been found, it, it dropped off, deposited along the way in places like Switzerland, I've mentioned, Austria, Germany, we've already mentioned, the Grauburgunder, and I said I would mention what sort of styles they produce in Germany, very dry but rich. So it's sort of a... Um, Weissburgunder and Grauburgunder both produce this sort of luscious, luxu luxurious, uh, rich styles of wine, but they do tend to be on the dry side. They leave the sweet wines to the Riesling grape. Uh, it can be found in Luxembourg, Slovenia, Moldova, um, so all over the place. But uh, it's, well, it's not been as much of a success story in any of those places as it has been in Northern Italy, you know, from a European point of view. But with the success of Pinot Grigio, that is changing. Um, so New World has embraced it perhaps better than or, or marketed it better than the European versions. So Oregon, oh my goodness. Um, Oregon has really championed Pinot Gris. And I say Gris because they don't produce Pinot Grigio styles as frequently that you can find them. But the best are the Pinot Gris styles uh, that we're about to go into. Um, we have the most incredible producer called Elk Cove from the Willamette Valley and their, their Pinot Gris is, it's age worthy. 
you know, I, I've got bottles downstairs that I'm keeping hold of. Um, we don't have any for sale at the moment. And I did look, I'm, I'm usually checking. But if you get a chance to buy an Elk Cove Pinot Gris, please do. Absolutely beautiful wine. Um, Washington State also produced quite a bit. And plantings are increasing in California. We do have a blend at the moment, a Californian blend that includes, incu- ooh, pardon me, includes some Pinot Gris. Um, then also Australia, we have Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio styles. And we have got an Australian one for sale at the moment as well. Um, But you can find both. Now, it's really important when you are shopping in those new world regions in particular, they have a choice to call it Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio. And the name that they give it will give you the clue as to what style of wine it is. So if they have specifically called it a Pinot Grigio, that is because they are producing a wine in the style of wine one. We're talking those sort of early to mid harvest picks, the stainless steel, and then that brings this lovely light, refreshing, um, citrusy, um, really pleasant and fun and fruit forward wine. Um, So do be aware the labeling. Because, and that leads me perfectly onto the next wine, that what they can do is choose to label it Pinot Gris, much like our New Zealand producer has here. Now, this is a, um, oh, thank you, Mahesh. Mahesh has put the links in the chat. If you're not looking at the chat today, don't worry, I'll include them in the follow-up email. Um, But let's go to New Zealand. New Zealand, actually, I, sorry, I hate doing the bottle labels. It never works. I've got a photo of it in a minute um so we're going to New Zealand now I used to work at West London Wine School and I used to work with a lovely Kiwi lady called Cherie and she told me that um she told me that basically if you you're a local in New Zealand and you're in the wine scene and we're talking sort of six five six years ago now but she said if you're in the wine scene you don't get caught dead taking uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc round to your friend's house you take Pinot Gris and she said that was you know that was the winemaker's grape uh, and it's interesting because it's it's really had a a growth since the 1990s and they improved the clonal selection so that's the plant material so they they picked better clones and and clones that were more suited to where they were and they increased those increased aromatics so they got this sort of richer definitely more tropical uh thing going on and it had this sort of renewed enthusiasm so i think bear with me let me see if i can there we go. So so actually, Pinot Gris is a really, really popular grape in New Zealand. So it accounts for, well, there are 2,593 hectares. Um, and that's quite a decent amount. I'll tell you that. And it says 5% of total production. That doesn't sound like very much. But when you account for the fact that Sauvignon Blanc is 71% of New Zealand's production, then there's not much picking in, not much slim pickings rather in the um, in the rest. To give you an idea, I've put the Chardonnay figure in as well because people think of Chardonnay as an international variety, and it's certainly quite easy for us um, as consumers to get Chardonnay from New Zealand. But Chardonnay is actually only six percent of the production, so Pinot Gris and Chardonnay are pretty neck and neck. It's three percent of the exports. Again, Sauvignon Blanc makes up sixty eight percent of the exports. Chardonnay two percent. So. Where are the gaps? Well, actually, red wine um, over indexes, should we say, in in exports of New Zealand um, wine. But it is the third most planted white grape variety. So after Chardonnay and after Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris is the third most planted grape variety of New Zealand. Most of, I'm just going to flick back to the map, most of the Pinot Gris is produced in Marlborough. And that is also where our wine is from. Um, And the nice thing about Marlborough is there's this lovely, cool climate at the south in within the south island that produces aromatic wines but the it's the hole in the ozone layer quite frankly and um, the sunshine hours in in marlborough are amazing and the key indicators often for flavor of new zealand pinot gris are things like peach and red apple now if you compare that to the wine we just spoke about did you hear me mention any stone fruits we said green apple, but definitely not red apple. Um, so it produces a completely, completely different style of wine here. So let's talk about this wine and taste along. Now, I have to say this is an absolute favorite of mine. I was talking to my dad about it last week as my perfect wine for a Thai curry. Um, it's 
yeah, it's brilliant. It's got these incredible aromatics. I will tell you about it in a moment, but I'm desperate to have a smell. Um, I actually think Pinot Gris from New Zealand can have not lemon, but lemongrass, which is probably why I think it's so good with, with uh, a curry. Um, but yeah, very peachy, very red fruits, almost nectarine actually on the peach. Um, it's got some tropical things going on as well, bordering on mango, although that is probably a bit of a stretch, but the peachy thing is just lovely. It's such, such a different style of wine. If you have got all three, please try the two next to each other. And then when we add the third, try that as well. I love that it's all the same grape and it's completely different. Um, this is a Wine Society exclusive. The vineyard is called Morisco Vineyards, but it's started by Brent Maris. Um, he's sort of Marlborough royalty, actually. His father worked at Wither Hills and then he set up um, the Ned. So Brent set up the Ned. Uh, you may have seen that label before, the sort of very classic black label with um, white writing. Um, this particular wine is selected from vineyards in the Wahaipo Valley, which is Marlborough, New Zealand, and they selected um, special blocks of Pinot Gris. And this is quite interesting because it is so sunny. They wanted to kind of produce a wine that that has the tightness and the acidity and the refreshingness of that Pinot Gris we just tasted, but they also, you know, wanted to produce a Pinot Gris, sorry, Pinot Grigier, Pinot Gris style with all the extra um, oomph and body and, and lusciousness and extra fruits. So to do that, what they did is they picked in, at the night, in the nighttime, and that ensures that when the grapes are heading to the winery, they're staying cool. They're not starting to ferment. They have complete control. Um, then what they did is they pressed the fruit and they left it to settle. So they let all of the sort of um, heavy, dense bits of the fruit gently settle for 24 hours. And that's all in small stainless steel tanks. And then they take that clear juice and they inoculated it with yeasts. Now, the reason I say that is they were really, really precise and careful to pick yeast to pick yeasts that promoted the stone fruit character so that peachy character and also they wanted to encourage some floral notes which I absolutely think you can get here again I think it comes down to that Thai green curry thing I get jasmine you get a really lovely sort of you know and I want to have my jasmine rice and my Thai green curry with it I didn't I just say I wasn't gonna do any food pairings and now all I can talk about is think about is food thank goodness I have had my dinner <laughs> Yeah, absolutely lovely. They um, do another long, cool fermentation. And what they do then is all those little parcels I mentioned that they'd picked individually, they then blend those into the late autumn and decide the perfect sort of composition. Um, yeah, and it is exclusive to us. So I'm going to have a quick taste, having just smelt all the deliciousness. Mm. Oh. So if you're tasting along, hopefully one thing that you will really notice the difference on is the texture. Um, I've just had a, seen the message from Tracy. Love this with juicy pear and a hint of orange. Absolutely, Tracy. And it's almost that kind of blood orange. Um, it's got a gorgeous, or, yeah, it's orange plus tropicalness. What terrible English that was. <laughs> but hopefully one new thing you notice, everyone, is, is the palette is completely different. I'm getting this kind of um, rich, uh, dense, mouth-filling sensation, and it's uh, it's unctuous. It's sort of slightly thicker, um, but it's got a really slight smokiness to it. Now, Pinot Gris, not Grigio, Pinot Gris style wines often do have that slight smokiness. This hasn't been in, a, in an oak barrel where you can also get smokiness. It's inherent to the grape variety. And I've just seen a uh, comment about whether how different Kumu, um, the Kumu River Pinot Gris is. I'll be honest, I haven't tasted it in a while, but from memory, it's even smokier. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, if you are tasting the Kumu, Pat. Um, but very, very similar in terms of the, the rich mouthfeel, the texture, that slight bit of glycerol. Um, but yes, that smokiness is starting to come through as well. So hugely interesting. The other thing I get here that I didn't get at all on the Pinot Grigio is the skin of the red apple. It's almost got that kind of um, slight furry skin feel in a really, really pleasant way, but loads of more tropical fruits and stone fruits as well. Right. Delicious.
Um, so as I mentioned, we've done something slightly strange. We've gone from, oh, I've got, I actually think I've got a picture. Sorry, bear with me of where this has grown. Yes, I do. How lovely. You'll see that this isn't grown on particularly hilly sites. Um, there aren't that many in Marlborough anyway. And um, there's smaller hillsides, um, but they get there's plenty of sunshine in Marlborough. So they actually don't need to, to increase the sunshine to get the ripeness of the Pinot Gris that they need. In fact, as I mentioned, they're picking at night to preserve freshness. So, um, but yes, I apologize for the roundabout way, but intentionally so that we have gone from Grigio to Gris this evening. We started with our Grigio, the light, refreshing, high acid lemon flavors. We moved into a classic Gris style, but from the new world. And now we're going to go to Alsace. Alsace is arguably where the finest Pinot Gris in the world is produced. I think you'd find it a little bit hard to, to not, um, well, to argue against that, should we say. And for anyone less familiar, this is Alsace here. Um, it hugs the border of Germany. Germany, as I mentioned, producing quite similar styles of Pinot Gris, um, Grauburgunder, but it's a very special climate. I won't go into the climate too in too much detail, but all you really need to know is huge amount of sunshine hours, very little rain. So actually, we're talking about a grape variety that likes a little bit of sunshine, but it's also quite far north and it can keep that acidity. Pinot Gris, Grigio, Grauburgunder, whatever you want to call it. If you produce it in too warm a climate, that acidity drops off. It becomes really sort of flabby and less interesting. So this is why Alsace sort of provides the perfect everything. Um, it, it provides a little. Um, it provides a little bit of of um sorry the latitude lo sorry longitude is is brilliant for the cool environment the grape needs but the sunshine and lack of rainfall can force the grape to work and produce a much much sort of richer style of wine than perhaps that you can find on the flat veneto plains not that this is from a flat veneto plain but it just puts things in context for you um, in terms of how much is produced in Alsace, uh, we have 10% vineyard area is Pinot Gris. So that's quite a decent chunk, especially when you consider that the more internationally recognized grapes perhaps are things like Riesling and Gewürztraminer. Um, it can produce wines that are bone dry, absolutely. And you find lots and lots and lots of them in Alsace, but it can also go all the way through to deliciously sweet. And when I say deliciously sweet, I mean it. It is a grape that can produce uh, Vendage Tardive, so late harvest, but it can also produce SGM wines, so Selection de Grand Nobile, uh, which are the botrytized wines. So we're talking proper, proper, little bottle, delicious, unctuous nectar from the gods, syrupy Pinot Gris as well. Um, it's, yeah, it's absolutely breathtaking the sweet wines um again i think we have one i will include it in the notes if we do um but sadly it would uh this is this is a great compromise because this has some sweetness and can show you what me pinot gris does in that that um medium dry or i would probably argue medium sweet um category which is great but if you are a sweet wine fan pinot gris is fantastic and it's really really interesting um in terms of generally what style it produces if we're not talking about sweet wines um it's it competes with Gewürztraminer in terms of body and weight and it's well it they grow it in the lower parts of Alsace in particular and that's because it does need that extra weight to make it really interesting but you still have the coolness to keep the acidity now this particular uh sorry this is map of Alsace <laughs> should you wish to have one um oh Mahesh has said he can't see a sweet one on the web they are made in really small quantities so when we do have them they don't last very long so um apologies if I wet your whistle for something we don't currently have in stock but if you do ever see them please uh and you and you are have a penchant for sweet wines definitely worth a try um now Hashborg is the grand cru that this particular wine comes from Hashborg, why is it so special? Uh, so it's slightly further south um, in the grand scheme of Alsace. So it gets a tiny bit more sunshine, but actually the soils just really suit it. So I've put a few stats um, about Hatchborg here. Um, it has a the terroir has a surface of 
0.36 hectares. It's, uh, it's not the biggest uh, Grand Cru by any stretch. Now, this is interesting. The slopes are, um, I dr again, drove past it yesterday. Wish I could have visited, but didn't. But the slopes are, um, it's basically a little hill that almost. And they are between the, the Grand Cru wine has to be grown um, at certain elevations in Alsace. That's one of the rules and regulations. And I'm going to go on to that in a moment. But the Hashburg vineyard is between 210 and 330. This particular wine is grown at the higher end of that. So I think from memory, it's 250 to 330, but I suspect it's slightly different to that, but it's certainly the higher part. Um, so again, we're getting even cooler, but the thing about Grand Cru sites is they have to be on those slopes. Um, it's one of the things that makes them so special. The soils are particularly good. If you imagine down the bottom, the soils are very eroded from the from any water runoff, and they're slightly different because of the geology. The soils on the slopes are wonderful for, for viticulture. So the other thing that we have here is this marl and limestone. So um, it's a substrate that's got lots of soils. It's got um, uh, scree deposits um, and loess, loess, I can never say that word. Um, but so the soil is quite heavy. It's quite deep, um, but it is uh, well well draining, but it is a heavier soil. And Pinot Gris quite likes that. So in this particular, um, in this particular Grand Cru vineyard, Gewurztraminer and Pinot Gris are really the two most popular varieties. And Riesling actually takes a bit of a backseat to those two. It's got beautiful south southeast exposure, so it's getting plenty of sunshine to get that extra ripeness. And the sort of typical wines of, of uh, Hashburg are very developed aromas, so intense and rich, and they do tend to age incredibly well. So this particular wine, I mentioned that I was going to talk about what... Um, the fact, in fact, I'll do that quickly now, just before we move on. Um, the Grand Cru, there are a couple of rules. And uh, let me take this down a moment. Oops. Yeah, Grand Cru, Grand Cru vineyards in Alsace have some interesting rules about them. And you may remember, don't worry if you don't, you might be three wines in, it's fine. Uh, but you may remember that I said that Pinot Grigio della Vinizzi has a, has a, maximum yield of 126 hectolitres per hectare. That's not the yield of this wine, but that is the maximum that they are allowed to use to pr produce that DOC. It's worth mentioning that they're just, if they're just producing a Pinot Grigio IGP wine, that's not even DOC, that yield limit is even higher. So that's how you get this sort of, when you start reaching 140, 160 hectolitres, that's where your grapes are basically being asked to produce so much fruit at such a high yield that um, you're probably doing it on a very, very fertile, watery plain. And really that water is just translating into quite a dilute flavor in your grape. To flip reverse it, Grand Cru vines in Alsace, maximum can be 55 hectoliters per hectare. And it doesn't matter what you're growing, but that is the maximum if you want to label it with the name of the Grand Cru. And that's across all Grand Cru sites in Alsace. This particular wine, I'm really annoyed. I didn't manage to get the exact hectolitre per hectare in time, but rest assured, it is going to be much, much lower. Now, what that means is it's really concentrating the fruit. So it's very important that those, those yields are limited in order to make this denser, richer, complex, more concentrated fruit. And I mentioned I was going to talk about where it's grown is very different, how it's grown is very different. And yield management for Pinot Gris slash Grigio is one of the key factors. If you can manage that yield, if you can keep the yield really small and it's still commercially viable, that's when you start to produce the really, really interesting wines. So let's talk about this wine because it is really, really interesting and I think incredibly affordable. So made for us by the Catan, well, sorry, made in general, not for us exclusively like the other two wines. This is made for everyone, <laughs> um, but it's made by the Catan family. And they uh, it's a Swiss immigrant, actually, who started this business in 1720. And I mentioned the the um, we actually did recently did a Catan family Edelsvicker, which is a sort of blend, really lovely traditional blend of noble um, grapes. We, they make Cremants, sparkling wines of Alsace. They make these sorts of wines. They make dry wines. They make those Vendage Tardive wines and they make Selection de Grand Nobel, Nobel wines as well. So they make the whole, the whole lot. Um, and this is one of their Grand Cru sites. I think from memory, there are only three families that have vines in Hashburg. It could even be two. 
that the cations are one of them. So they have a, a good affinity with this particular site. They do limit their yields. We've already spoken about that. They prune it in the Guyot style. And that's quite, um, th there's been quite a lot of work done on, on the ideal pruning for Pinot Gris as well. Um, and they also do sustainable farming. They hand harvest everything. And I think legally a Grand Cru has to be hand harvested in Alsace anyway. Um, they really gently press the grapes and then they ferment at 18 to 22 degrees. So possibly not quite as cool as these two. Um, but certainly still a cool ferment. Um, and then what they do is they, this is where things get interesting. They age in big old oak casks. And that's very, very different to the styles uh, that we've just, well, not very, very different to the middle style because they do quite a few things similar about their picking times. But certainly this is the first wine that we've had that has any oak influence at all. The big oak casks are because they don't want to add oak flavour, but what they want to do is bring out this sort of rich, um, I actually love the word fatty, the kind of fatty, unctuous notes. Um, and yes, they have left some residual sugar in there as well. So um, you'll notice that the alcohol level is still 13.5%. However, they picked the grapes when they were so beautifully ripe far, far riper than the, any Pinot Grigio uh, Veneto producer would pick. They almost let them get to the point where they're sort of on the edge. And then um, because they have that beautiful acidity from the cool climate, but the sunshine, that's how they're able to produce off dry styles, i.e. still leave some residual sugar in. If you remember the fermentation being a weighing scales, if all of the sugar is used up, then it's a higher alcohol wine. If only part of the sugar is used up, then it can be a mid-alcohol wine. This is not a mid-alcohol wine. It's a it's a 13.5% because there was so much natural sugar and natural sort of um, glucose in those grapes to start with because they received such an incredible ripening. So let's try the hashborg. Um, I haven't had this wine in a long time and I actually haven't even tasted it today. So I'm very excited. Um, oh yeah. So on the nose that I actually get the smokiness on the nose here more than I did on the Pinot Gris from, from our uh, Kiwi. This is, yeah, this is much smokier on the nose here. I'm definitely getting red apple and that red apple skin. Um, I'm getting almost a, um, what's the name of it? It's like an Asian pear. Um, really, really rich, but I'm also getting some pear as well. I'm lo I've am i lost, not completely, but I've certainly, um, I'm getting preserved lemon. There's no fresh, juicy lemon like there was in the Pinot Grigio. It's not a spritz of lemon on your seafood. This is cooked lemon, if you see what I mean. Oh, lovely. And a slight minerality as well. So I'm going to give it a taste. Hmm. So immediately, the first thing you'll notice if you're tasting along is a touch of sugar. Now, that is, for me, beautifully balanced in this wine. There is some residual sugar, but it's balanced really well with the acidity. Is there as much acidity as my mouth watering as much as the first wine, the Pinot Grigio? No. And that comes down to, I mentioned, the longer you leave the Pinot Gris on the vine, the lower the acidity will be. But is the wine in balance? Yes. Um, I don't find it overly flabby. I don't find it fat to the point where it's unattractive. It's the perfect amount of fat for me. Um, really unctuous with the glycerol. So we've now moved into a very, very rich, rich wine. Um, and it's very red apple-y on the palate for me. It's um, There is that touch of smoke. The hint of sweetness at the end for me is a bit almost dried fruits. So, um, you, you know, you can get those ap dried pieces of apple. It's almost bordering on there. It's that really, really intense concentrated fruit flavours. Please let me know if you're tasting along because I'd be very keen. If you've not tried a, a Pinot Gris of this style before, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Um, and since I've done food pairings with everything, <laughs> I think I may as well throw one in here for our final minute of the, the, the um, presentation. Now, when I was driving through Alsace this day, and I do say driving through, I didn't really get to stop. But what I did do was pick up a quick lunch, which was a pretzel with Munster cheese melted in the middle and lardons. Very, very good for the diet. 
delicious um now that is exactly the sort of food i'd be putting with this wine rich cheeses munster cheese would just be heaven with this wine but any sort of rich salty food it will bring out the fruit in the wine it will bring out that um sort of um sweet touch and that sweet salty um contradiction i should say works beautifully um what else would i pair with it i wouldn't i would go for a curry with this but the only thing i'd say is it's a bit less refreshing and aromatic in the sense of the lemongrass um as as my um as my three terraces was, you could definitely still go for something on on a Thai or Indi um, South Indian um, feeling. But I do have to say that I think the Alsatians have kind of nailed it. Rich, creamy foods. I would just about go for a fish pie, but I think that's because most of my most of my wines I like to drink go with fish pies. Rich, rich wine and fish pie doesn't get better than that. But anything with a kind of creamy sauce where you don't need too much acidity to cut through it. That's the only thing I would say, because this isn't your sort of super high acid um, cut through wine. This is definitely more rich goes with rich. Um, oh, Stuart says this wine is fantastic. Never tried it before. Great. I'm so glad because this is... Um, yeah, this is a really, really different wine. And I think a lot of people get scared by this style of wine. And actually, it's um, yeah, it's very, very special. Peter says the Alsatian is a wonderful wine to drink on its own, but it's a bit sweet compared to a lot of Alsace Pinot Gris. And I couldn't agree more, Peter. This is a med I mentioned it's a medium sweet wine, and I wanted to put a medium sweet style in. Pinot Gris from Alsace comes in all, all the spectrums. Um, and this being from Hashburg from those dense soils, from the sort of slightly further south and warmer climes than the, than the wines grown further north. Naturally, it lends itself to that extra ripeness to allow the residual sugar into the wine. So don't think that all Pinot Gris, sorry, Pinot Gris from Alsace are produced in this style. They're not, but they're also not all dry wines. They're, they go into, it can go into Cremant. It can, it can produce the whole range. So we could do an entire session on the Pinot Gris of Alsace. Um, I'd be down for it. But this is a really interesting style and it shows you that sort of medium sweet um, offering that Pinot Gris can give. There are very few wines in the world, uh, great varieties, I should say, that can do sparkling, dry, medium sweet, sweet and botrytized um, or semi botrytized um, and Pinot Gris is one of them. So, yes, <laughs> um, <coughs> pardon me, too excited. Um, Herein ends the presentation. I am very much around to stick around um, and answer any questions. For those of you leaving now, cheers. I hope you found a wine you liked. There really is a Pinot Gris or a Pinot Grigio for everyone. I completely believe in that. Um, it's a style of wine so underappreciated around the world. And other than my small outburst of saying there might be a nice surprise, <laughs> there might be a nice surprise, um, about the Pinot Grigio um, but all of the other wines are still available well that one is still available for sale but they're all um all available for sale and any of the other Pinot Grigios I will send in, and Pinot Gris I will send an email tomorrow so watch this space but yes cheers everyone leaving now and if not if you're staying around to, for me to answer a couple of questions then let's continue with the glass <laughs> um so right let's start with Beth's is this a similar situation to Shiraz and Syrah in the New World regions where you will name it according to the style? You absolutely got it in one Beth. Um, so for anyone less familiar with Syrah and Shiraz, Syrah and Shiraz, uh, winemakers across the New World, it's, uh, I suppose it's slightly different in the sense that Shiraz came from Australia. So, um, you know, what made Shiraz the word famous is Australian Shiraz. Here we are talking about two European styles, i.e. Uh, Pinot Grigio and Pinot Gris, and they're d direct translations. So I suppose that's really the only difference. It's a translation between French and, and Italian. But in terms of our winemakers selecting the correct terminology to give you an idea of their style that they're trying to produce, absolutely. Beth, you got it in one. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, so yes, for anyone a bit uh, who wants to know a bit more of that, Syrah tends to be a bit more refined, a bit more peppery. So if you get a New Zealand Syrah, for example, you might get black pepper on the nose um, and sort of a less uh, sweet fruits, more black tart fruits. Um, whereas if you get a New Zealand Shiraz, they might have left it growing on the vine a little bit longer. They might choose to use some New World Oak. Um, 
uh, or just generally a bit more a bit more flavorful oak newer oak um so that tends to be sweeter fruits less of the black pepper more of the kind of unctuous currants I've used unctuous a lot today sorry <laughs> so thanks beth great comment and great question um jt do you think that pinot blanc is underrated especially compared to the popularity of bulk produced grigio a hundred percent um if i didn't answer it already i think pinot blanc um Pinot, well, sorry, yes, I misread that question. Pinot Gris, I think absolutely yes, under un, hugely underrated. Pinot Blanc, i.e. the other mutation, I think is a nice grape variety. I don't think it's as interesting personally for me as Pinot Gris. Um, one thing Pinot Blanc does do exceptionally well, and I hope I am answering the question as you intended, but one thing Pinot Blanc does exceptionally well, i.e. the white, whiter skinned grape, uh, mutation of this is it takes very well to something called autolysis, which is the autolytic flavor of um, that you get in champagne. So it's dead yeast cells. And so really good, but you can also get it from from lees stirring. So for me, Pinot Blanc can be a little bit bland. But if you make Pinot Blanc for me personally with um, some lees contact or as a sparkling wine, a traditional method sparkling wine, that's when it starts to become really interesting. It acts as a bit of a sponge to take those flavors. So um, Pinot Blanc with, yeah, if you see batonnage or lees stirring, something like that, you tend to get a bit more of a richer style. Um, it doesn't have the, the interesting skins that sometimes you can get um, some flavors from that Pinot Gris has, um, and it can produce a, a quite a bland grape. However, that being said, as I just mentioned, made in a kind of winemaker style, I think Pinot Blanc could be really interesting. Um, Mahesh, I should mention that Mahesh is the merchandiser for Alsace, so you couldn't have a better person behind the scenes uh, making Alsace recommendations. He drinks them, you know, I was about to say like water, but that's mean, isn't it, Mahesh? I didn't mean that. But he's just sent me a message saying that he thinks the Turkheim Pinot Blanc is a really great value for an everyday drinker. And I completely agree. Um, it's a lovely, uh, refreshing style, but it's definitely got a bit of complexity and depth. So if you'd like to try a Pinot Blanc, um, that would be a good one to give a go. Uh, let me have a quick look. I've got a few more Q&As. Ah, now, I did see this pop up in the chat and I forgot to come back to it. Somebody has asked, is Pinot Gris or Grigio, whichever, PG, I like that you called it that, grown successfully in the UK? I have yet to come across a Pinot Gris grown successfully in the UK. I can make a guess as to why that is. Um, and this is a guess. And I hope you don't mind that I'm, that I'm giving you a thought. Um, Pinot Gris slash Grigio, although it needs the cool climates to keep the acidity high or cooler climates and it needs some um, influence in that sense it does need a lot of sunshine hours and the way that a grape growing season is is sort of analyzed one of the ways of doing it is literally sunshine hours during the specific growing season so after the raison etc right through to ripening I don't believe in the UK and I could be wrong I don't believe that we have actually got enough sunshine hours of the correct um, strength to fully ripen Pinot Gris. I am very happy for somebody to disagree with me on that and give me an example of it being grown in the UK, but I suspect that that will be why. Um, we're probably not even going to get there with global warming because it's not the temperature, it's the degree day, well, heat degree days I suppose but it could just be a sunshine factor um, and some grapes love the sun and Pinot Gris actually does love the sun likes to be cool but in the sun um not dissimilar to my whippet actually <laughs> um, uh, so I hope I answered that question but I did answer it with a guess so beware uh, Peter Cousins, I know nothing about wine marketing does the fact that Pinot Grigio and Prosecco are so popular mean that the market goes for people that don't want to think about what they're drinking oh that is a fascinating question peter and um, and one that would feel very at home on a sort of mw exam paper pinot grigio ha there are lots of people and i can I understand this argument there are lots of people that say pinot grigio is so popular because it doesn't taste like very much when it's made in those high yield styles and um, that people are just consuming it because they want to consume alcohol 
and they don't mind what it tastes like necessarily. Now, if you take a um, pub chain Pinot Grigio um, or, or a real bargain, um, you know, three for a tenner Pinot Grigio, for example, um, often those are produced at those really, really high yields, 150 plus. But um, not only that, if you think about the conditions that they're then served in, and this is just a sort of a roundabout way of arguing your, of, of coming to your point. If you think about the conditions they're served in in the pub, often sort of blanched with ice buckets, um, then I think that argument does stand. Those particular styles, that is not this style of Pinot Grigio, by the way. I think, unfortunately, some, some of the people that love to drink the Pinot Grigio that is inoffensive at best, I think that's what Jancis used to describe it, inoffensive at best, and then sort of left it at that. The very, very, um, she's talking about the very dilute styles. Now, if you poured a Pinot Grigio of that dilute style that had been sat in an ice bucket and was absolutely frozen, you are going to get very little flavor. This is a semi-aromatic grape variety. That's why a style like this is really lovely because it's brought the character out. You can still have it chilled and it can still be very pleasurable and pleasant, but it has some substance. And the substance isn't the mouth weight of these wines, which are real wine, whiny wines. These are, these are wines made for somebody who enjoys their wine and wants to think about their wine. This style of Pinot Grigio, the society's Pinot Grigio, is, is, it's not a wimpy Pinot Grigio, but those wimpy styles, I get your point. If you kind of want to just drink a glass of wine and not think about it, and I really mean not think about it, then of course they're very, um, they're very helpful. Ah, Paul has said that there is a Pinot Grigio from Bolney in Sussex. You are exactly right. Um, do you know what, Paul? I've not tasted it. Uh, Bolney is or has been, and I should say this, they're really, really good at um, their viticulture. They are a, they have been ripening grapes. I think the first Pinot Noir I ever tried was from Bolney and they have uh, worked tirelessly to get their, get grapes ripe that other parts of the country haven't been able to get ripe. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. There is a Pinot Gris and interesting that they're calling it Pinot Gris, not Pinot Grigio. So good shout, Paul. Um, well, that's all the questions that I can see. Bear with me. We're four minutes till the end. Um, there we go. Yes, that is all of the questions. Apologies, I don't think anyone's known. I just had to check that nobody had typed anything else. Great stuff. Thank you, guys. Um, I really enjoyed tonight. I hope that you did too. I know it was a bit of a niche topic, but it's a topic I feel passionately about. I think there are really good Pinot Grigios in the world. <laughs> and I think there are really good Pinot Gris in the world as well. Um, and the really fun thing is that it is produced all over the world. Pinot Grigio, whether we love it, loathe it, and whether we agree with the di more dilute styles or not, Pinot Grigio is slowly getting the star the, the name out there more than ever. Um, so I think watch this space. I do think Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio will increasingly become popular, uh, especially as people look for alternatives. And in a really strange roundabout way, it's kind of a great middle ground between the two other most famous grapes in the world, which are... Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. Uh, for me, it you know, if you had a Sauvignon Blanc, absolute lover, and you had a Chardonnay, absolute lover, and you needed to find somewhere in the middle that you could all share a bottle with, I think Pinot Gris for me is the great variety that does that. So hope you enjoyed a glass, two or three, um, and look forward to seeing you at the next Focus On session. Thank you, Mahesh, as always, and I hope you enjoyed uh, a glass of something yourself this evening. Thank you all and good evening.